Now, the story goes that Lord Vizetif was actually sent out by his father, the king, <coughs> Jacob's son, in fact. And his task, it may be perceived, was to actually find out and try and locate somewhere around the world the actual number of chambers that the Egyptian god Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, -H, or the Ibis god, got of literature. How many chambers Toth actually had in his pyramid? Because Cheops was infatuated by this, or Khufu is his other uh, Egyptian name that he's usually uh, known by. Jedef, on his journeys, apparently two seasons westward, which would be difficult to understand considering this side is lying near the coastline of uh, New South Wales, and two seasons westward would have meant that he had to have come across the Pacific Ocean to reach us here. In contradiction to a literal translation made according to this site, uh, or a, a translation made for this site, and the hieroglyph is contained on both walls. It appears that uh, the Jedef travelled over hills, mountains, and no lakes during his two seasons of uh, journeys westward. And coming across that very rough and severe terrain, it is apparently interpreted that the boat was left stranded on a dry riverbed, devoid of repairs. Unable to take the vessel any further because the lakes had all dried up and the river had all dried up, delivering this supposedly about 4,000 years ago. On his journey, he was unfortunately bitten by a snake twice and unfortunately also went into a very quick decline as far as his condition and well-being was concerned, to the point that he actually died and was apparently carried by his members, uh, bearing the sacred orb of the hawk, a golden orb of the hawk, to this particular location where he was buried and entombed, as one of these caduceus here says, in the rocks below us. Now there is a, a little tomb, or cave as it were, just up above this particular cliff, certainly an entrance to the side, and some of the cliffs along this wall do actually protect tomb or a chamber that has three entrances, and certainly there's three entrances to this particular area. So some of it does bear truth, but the controversy and difficulty that we do have with this particular area is unfortunately the fact that two outstanding features tend to discourage the factuality of this site and the reality that it actually was done by the ancient Egyptians. The first is the assumption in the uh, record that has been available, which says that this is all written in archaic Egyptian. Now, archaic Egyptian was the first formalised form of hieroglyphics used by the Egyptians, usually in the first and second dynasties. Now, those two dynasties actually precede Cheops and Snerefer, who were mentioned on these walls, and Zuzhedef as well, who were pharaohs of the fourth dynasty by, as you may have guessed, anything up to two dynasties. Now, also, the language and styles actually mean that the journey itself, it's been recorded, was conducted within about, about a 1,000 year period. So it's not exactly spot on. The use of an archaic English hieroglyphic style to record the events of someone in a more modern dynasty is unusual to say the least. And generally, with the language having modified due to changes in structure or changes in tools that were used to form the iconic representations, it's more likely that it would have been in a later dynasty or in the dynasty of the episode at the time, which would have put it around about the 4th or 5th dynasty hieroglyphic style. And they're quite different to archaic. So here we have someone going through an extraordinary amount of work to make a representation in a story, which may or may not be, actually have a factual basis. In reading the hieroglyphics, the easiest way to determine how to read them and in which direction to read them in is to look at the way the direction in which the faces are pointing and the animals are pointing, or the characters within the hieroglyphics are pointing. And generally, the direction in which they're pointing is the direction in which you read the lines or columns of hieroglyphics as they appear. Certainly with my own investigation of the site, I haven't really found a great deal of correlation between some of the symbols used and the hieroglyphics that had been deciphered from various papyri and uh, pyramid to walls essentially for that period governing the late archaic through to the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Middle Kingdom extending as far as the 13th dynasty of Pharaohs. So there's a lot of controversy 
there's a lot of speculation. And the biggest risk, I think, really, that we have to take into account and address very, very carefully is one of the preservation of the site until a more formal evaluation and analysis can be conducted by someone with a great deal of experience in the archaic language. Now, the problem is there's not a lot of archaic language actually existent in Egypt. Uh, the remains of the tombs in Mastabas or Pharaoh's uh, temples uh, or priest temples of the time. In fact, there's not a lot of remains actually still intact from that archaic period. So therefore, it's hard to actually make a true decipherment of these hieroglyphics without leading, leading oneself to using extrapolation based on later uh, versions of the hieroglyphic text itself. Nonetheless, it's a fascinating site, and as you would have seen from some of the hieroglyphics presented already, and some of them that we'll be presenting after this, you certainly, certainly do get a very awesome feeling about it. And you can see why this path itself through the two clefts within the rocks. A big overhead canopy of boulders above us certainly was a sacred site, or part of the dreaming trail of the Brismwater Aboriginals who found these splits within the rock to have been associated with the transit of the army there, supreme being. Eddie's moved towards the top of the mountain before he then ascended into the heavens above. One of the dreaming stories of the creation of Australia and the Earth has been handed down from generation to generation of Aboriginal people right around the country itself of Australia. Well, thanks for your time today. It's a very brief look at a very unique and unusual site. And certainly uh, we'd hope to see you next time on one of our tours. But we'll come and have another little explore and certainly try to make some sense of its anomaly within an otherwise Aboriginal rich historical area. It's my Peter from Coastal Let's Go Tours. Thank you very much for joining me today.